SPJIMR Center for Wisdom and Leadership presents its podcast series Sapiens. It is about the practical aspects of a wisdom-based approach on leadership, various global and societal issues. Hello, welcome to Sapiens, a special podcast series brought to you by SPJMR, Center for Wisdom and Leadership. I am Surya Tahora, Executive Director of Seawheel, and today, for the seventh episode, I will be in conversation with Chris Laszlo. He's a professor of organizational behavior at Case Western Reserve University, Weatherhead School of Management. He researches and teaches flourishing enterprises and is also author of Quantum Leadership, Flourishing Enterprises, uh, Embedded Sustainability, and Sustainable Value, all from Stanford University Press books. His research has been published in a wide range of journals and is a fellow of the International Academy of Management and past chair of the Management, Spirituality, and Religion division at AOM. Hi, Chris. I'm really pleased and excited to have you today as my guest to this new episode of uh, Sapiens from SeaWorld. And I would like to start by something which has been intriguing me since I've been reading your book um, called Quantum Leadership, A New Consciousness in Business. So how has a person over the years, maybe 10, 20, 30 years, have you come to bring together all these different, uh, let's say, domains uh, which have apparently nothing in common, uh, from leadership to all this uh, emerging science around quantum physics and neuroscience, evolutionary biology, and so on, and organizational behavior and leadership. So what is the personal story which made Chris Laszlo uh, engage over the years into this kind of work that you are doing now. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Surya. And first of all, let me say what a pleasure it is for me to be here and to uh, engage with you in this uh, exciting conversation. To your question about uh, how I got here, I, I should say uh, I my early part of my career was a traditional business uh one, where I joined in my mid to late 20s, I joined a Fortune 500 company. I became a vice president in that company for nine years. I was uh, had different roles, including general manager of a um, manufacturing subsidiary with, uh, you know, about 100 people that, that I was responsible for. Um, so that may sound like a rather traditional, old fashioned kind of uh, career. But um, I think we have to go further back, really, to my high school years. When I was, uh, when I was about 15 years old, um, I was at a high school uh, in Switzerland where there were a large, uh, large group of students. And every morning we would start with a morning meditation. And, and usually a teacher would go and say a few words there. But for, for some reason, um, I was talked into going in and giving the talk that morning to the whole student body. And so I found myself going up on the stage and sitting there and having a few moments of quiet. And then I spoke for about five or 10 minutes about our responsibility to uh, the world's poor, uh, to taking care of the environment, to uh, our generation's responsibility for a world that is going to be more fair and more uh, a healthier world. And it, when, I, when, I, when I spoke it, I don't know exactly where it came from. I'm not sure why uh, that was, but it was something that felt very natural, like this is who I am. And then, of course, what happened was I went to university. I studied economics. I eventually got my PhD in economics and went into business, and I almost, almost, but not quite forgot about this early part. But, you know, for many years in my, in my career, I wondered why is it that business profitability, 
the competitive dynamics in, of business have to be separate and in parallel to the questions about the business role in society. Why is profit and ethics so often separated? Why are practical uh, skills and wisdom uh, often considered to be separate in business? And uh, I, I was always interested in that, but uh, what happened was, in the, I think it was in the 1990s, so I was already into my 30s then, um, when I started to see that market forces were changing so that the businesses were starting to be held accountable for their negative or so-called externalities, you know, as economists call them. Yes, externalities. Yes, it's a very often yes. um, used word. Now we know that there are no externalities because there's no place to have these negative impacts. We're all on a small planet. But at the time, you know, um, it was, you started to see the uh, NOX and SOX uh, trading on the Chicago Commodity Exchange. You started to see uh, uh, companies being penalized for harming the environment. And so I thought, well, you know, maybe there's a, an opportunity to bring together uh, the role of the societal role of business and market forces in a more integrated way. And that really was the beginning of my career. So what triggered this uh, episode when you're uh, 15 to resurface and uh, then uh, make you ask yourself this uh, question again? Yes, what triggered it was my observation in the 1990s that ethic, ethical behavior in business and market behavior were not no longer completely separate, that they were starting to integrate because you, you, this wasn't, I didn't want to engage business in ethical, in, in discussions about moral behavior. Uh, what I was interested in was engaging business in how to be a better business, how to be a more profitable, more competitive business by also taking into account impacts on community, on the ecology, on human well-being. And so I saw this. And so I, I began, I, I started a consulting firm called Innovethics, which became Sustainable Value Partners a few years later. And then I started teaching at a business school in Europe called INSEAD. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, and it's it specific. So it's familiar. I've been studying uh, also there. Well, I started. I started teaching there in 2002 or approximately 2002, and then in 2003, I published my first research. I published my book called "The Sustainable Company." Allow me. Uh, could I say a few more words still about this? Of course. Yes. Uh, please, Chris. Yeah. Please go ahead. So what happened at that point was I really focused on the relationship between business and its external environment, uh, sort of in a Michael Porter kind of way, you know, looking at this as right. a, a competitive dance between the organization and its external environment. Um, and so I then uh, continued to do research and teaching that uh, focused on how businesses can create value for society and the environment in ways that allow them to create even more value for their customers and shareholders. And then a big epiphany came. I would almost call it a, a, personal, a personal disaster. In 2011, I published what I thought was my best book called Embedded Sustainability, The Next Big Competitive Advantage. But almost the day it was published, I had a feeling that it was in some ways not enough, that it was even obsolete. And the, the aha moment I had at that point is that trying to make the business case for social and environmental responsibility would never truly transform business. That uh, business leaders are only going to do what is sometimes called uh, the low-hanging fruit, the easy stuff, you know, energy conservation, cutting waste, reducing material intensity, things that are obvious cost, uh, you know, cost-cutting measures and, you know, some perhaps more cosmetic kind of things, but that if we really wanted to engage the business community in creating a better world, 
we had to transform business leaders at the level of the individual. So after 2011, I shifted my career path, and that's what led to quantum leadership, which is the unit of analysis is the individual leader and no longer the organization. Okay, great. So um, I have another question, which is coming from this, um, uh, where you are coming from, and this narrative, which is new, but at the same time, it's been there for many years in many leadership theories, whether you speak about authentic leadership or transformational or servant leadership or more recently conscious capitalism or mindful leadership or even neuro leadership and so on. So I was wondering, how is this approach that you have now? Is it another kind of like leadership theory or model or so to put it differently how is your approach in continuity with this movement of shift of uh, towards another paradigm or is it something which is different uh, in terms of approach and if it is how is it different thank you for that question um, first i i am trying to build on similar efforts to shift in a more fundamental way the role of business and and shift in a more fundamental way how business leaders see not just their careers or their roles but uh, see um, the need for a, a different way to to participate in uh, you know a different set of needs that the world has today than they had, let's say, 100 years ago. 100 years ago, it was to produce more material things, you know, what economists call widgets, you know. Um, but today, today, the goal is to produce more well, it's about well-being, it's about experiences, it's about uh, being able to live in a healthy and even flourishing way uh, in shared prosperity on a healthy planet. So I think the goal has changed. So the, the first thing is I am trying to build on the work of others as much as possible. But there are a few things that I would say are distinct about the quantum leadership approach. The first is uh, the idea that science has a powerful hidden influence on how we view the world and how we behave. You don't have to be a quantum physicist uh, or even or, or a physicist at all in order to be influenced by uh, what physics tells us about how the world works. And, you know, this is not just Thomas Kuhn and his work on um, uh, scientific paradigms, the revolution of, of, in scientific paradigms or Kenneth Gergen. Um, and others who've talked about the, the, the hidden influence that science has on us. Um, it's the fact that Western science, particularly, I would say over the last 400 years, maybe from Kepler onwards, uh, but certainly with Newton and um, Descartes, yes, they um, began to portray a world that was uh, best described at least in physical terms, as constituting uh, particles, you know, at, uh, at the finest level, or smallest level, atoms and subatomic particles and forces. And, you know, in this Newtonian Cartesian paradigm, everything could be reduced to, to particles and then the, these four forces of gravity, the electromagnetic field and the strong and weak nuclear forces that hold uh, atoms together. And um, as is, has often been said by others, you know, the Newtonian universe is sort of this cold clockwork that slowly is winding down over time. Um, it, it doesn't have, doesn't leave much room for human spirit, for uh, it doesn't infuse the world with meaning or with consciousness or with uh, any notion of uh, enlivenment. Uh, it's a fairly dead place. <laughs> yes, a and machine, and everything has to be treated. It's a machine, yes, yeah. exactly. And so 
um, you know, the question is, uh, if you look at the social sciences, like economics, for example, uh, so the early uh, economists like Jevons, for example, one of the precursors to neoclassical economists, was very conscious of the need to use the tools of physics to formulate uh, a uh, discipline of economics that was also going to be mathematical, uh, quantitative, that used calculus uh, to do things like uh, identify equilibria, um, ma you know, maximum utility maximization, profit maximization, and so on. Because this was part of an effort to make these social sciences more credible. And of course, in um, in biology, we started to see the survival of the fittest uh, and uh, the notion of the competitive, you know, uh, nature is red in tooth and claw. Um, we started to see in philosophy with uh, um, the utilitarians, uh, John Stuart Mill, talking about utility maximization. Um, and so... And then we had the existentialists who talk about the bounded human being. So eventually what we had was we, we had a, um, a background understanding about the world we lived in, which was a world of separateness and selfishness and competitiveness. And uh, if, you, if you believe the thesis that this kind of background setting from science actually does influence our behaviors, then it's equally true that when a new science comes along, and actually it's not only quantum physics, it's uh, a whole configuration of sciences of which physics is perhaps only the center pin because it describes ultimately the behavior of the universe itself. So physics has a more central role. But if you think about, for example, evolutionary biology or epigenetics or um, sciences uh, of uh, the functioning of ecologies or uh, consciousness uh, research itself. Yes, consciousness, are, science, oh, and neuroscience, yes, yes. Yeah, and, and cosmology. Cosmology also, I mean, we used to think during Newton's time that the uh, universe was empty space. It was called a vacuum. We now know, we now know yeah, that actually cool, yeah. space is not empty. It's a plenum, right? And that between uh, dark matter and... Uh, and gravitational waves and uh, uh, dark um, dark energy that you know dark energy 95 percent of space is in fact uh, uh, it's it's a plenum but we're not able to observe it directly uh, but we can observe the effects of of that dark energy and so i think science has changed very fundamentally and in what that fundamental direction has it changed this part is quite easy to articulate it's gone. It's it's gone from separateness and and uh, uh, disconnection and emptiness and 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 sort of selfish human nature, um, utility maximizing. Exactly. Where, where where a physical world also exists out there in some sort of absolute reality, and what we are doing as scientists is we are using our. Uh, senses and our tools to sort of discover that ultimate reality out there. Well, the quantum paradigm, as you know, tells an extremely different story. It's almost as opposite the story as you could get. So the quantum story tells us that, in fact, the world exists in a state of superposition or potentiality, and that uh, we can, the, the world that we actually experience depends on the role of the observer, that when we observe uh, at, at the quantum level, when you observe a uh, potentiality or, or state of superposition, you collapse that potential into an actual, which is, of course, you know, the famous double slit experiment that has been done uh, with photons, but also electrons and even molecules now, um, and gives us the sense that we live in a participatory universe. And then, of course, uh, that's only part of it because the other fundamental aspect of quantum physics is that everything is fundamentally entangled, uh, that, that we live in a world where everything is connected in some deep way to everything else. 
um, the Bell theorem experiment. Uh, and by the way, the three Nobel prizes in physics went last year to quantum physics for not just, not just their theories, but their application of entanglement to practical technologies. Um, so Alain Aspect, for example, a French physicist in 1958 was the first one to be able to prove in the lab this notion of paired particles that share the same spin uh, can one influences the behavior of the other instantly over even great distances where it would appear that that influence is greater than the speed of light, showing that there's sort of a fundamental inter interconnection and coherence in the world. But without becoming too abstract or, or, you know, without losing people because it somehow becomes very conceptual science, what we can say is that we are starting to see in a lot of these scientific disciplines, the idea that the world has a wholeness, a oneness to it, and a interconnectedness to it that um, fundamentally should change how we think of each other. So for example, when I say, I feel connected to you, Surya, I don't just mean it metaphorically. I mean that in energy and information terms, you and I may actually be connected. About this point, uh, Chris, this, the language of science is becoming increasingly complex. So maybe there will be some CEOs or leaders who have a science or engineering background. They will be comfortable and even be attracted to this language. Uh, but on the other hand, some people will be at loss and they will say, hey, uh, what is it all this about? So um, I... Begin, I begin by asking people uh, how, how they experience uh, the world in terms of their sense of purpose, their own greater purpose, their, their own purpose in life, and also their connection to others and their connection to nature and their connection to the transcendent, the connection to God. And how well, we, we have a conversation about the fact that we live at a time in history when it's very easy to feel disconnected in all of those dimensions. You know, we the society has become very di divisive and fragmented. You know, it, we, we, it's, in, it's in part a technology thing. It's part a political thing, a socioeconomic thing. Um, you know, I read someplace that Generation Z, uh, these young, the, the younger generation, they have their uh, computer screen open and they have seven apps open at the same time at any given moment. Seven apps. So their their attention, their attention is very fragmented. Yeah, incredible. And and at the same time, if you allow me, Chris, um, because I have some of them in my classes, just like you do, and I see in them a kind of uh, angst. Yeah, in, in their relationship, for example, with the future of the world yes. uh, that they are going to live in. Yeah. That's right. Exactly. They have a big angst, but the, the, those points are related. The reason that many people feel an angst is because they feel fundamentally disconnected from their life purpose, from others, from nature and the transcendent. And, you know, there's a lot of academic research. Uh, Ian Mitroff and Elizabeth Denton and uh, Jody Fry and Judy Neal and many others who have looked at the, what is at the essence of a person's sense of well-being and, and particularly spiritual flourishing. It's that sense of being deeply connected to yourself, others, and the world around you. So I talk, I talk with executives about this sense of disconnection, about the fact that we are all exposed to forces that fragment us, that, that lead, us make, lead us, as you said, uh, feeling anxious. And so I, I ask them, isn't there a need to pay attention to this so that we can heal ourselves and make ourselves whole? And so then we talk about how do we do that? So one, one thing we can do is we can ask executives, what do you do in your life 
to counter this divisiveness and this fragmentation and to heal yourself and make yourself whole. This is a conversation. I have never yet met an executive that doesn't want to have that conversation. So we talk about what practices they have. What is it that they do to be able to feel whole and to feel more peaceful and to feel well? In, 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 in themselves. And, and, and of course, for leaders, business leaders like CEOs, the question is, what do you do for your teams, for your personnel, for your employees, so that they can also experience a greater sense of well-being and wholeness? And that leads us to conversations about practices, uh, what I call practices of connectedness, which is like mindfulness practices, but it's a bit broader. Because, you know, at least in the West, when we say mindfulness practices, we often think about Eastern and particularly Indian notions of, you know, uh, being more sort of uh, in a um, sitting cross-legged and chanting Om, you know. Yeah, that's so true. Yeah, yeah this is a popular imagery. Yeah, totally. Right. And, you know, in the, in the, but in the West, we have what I find is that many people are engaged in... Uh, practices of connectedness that are, that are, you know, I have a colleague in uh, Wyoming, for, for her, it's going and riding a horse in the, in, uh, through the mountains of Wyoming that is, is very uh, centering and, and connecting for her. Um, believe it or not, I have young, I have students who tell me that playing video games, it doesn't work for me, but for, for them, playing video games can also have an effect of wholeness and connectedness. What I've realized is that there are many different ways, many different paths to oneness. And, and, and so, but I'm, I'm almost there. So yeah, I'm almost there in terms of, the, of giving you an answer to your question. How do we engage CEOs? So when we have this conversation um, and we talk about the practices that they have, we start talking about mindfulness type practices. And then we talk about, well, what happens then? What is it that you experience? And most people say, well, I experience, uh, I experience a, a, a sense of peace or I, I experience a sense of being better, mieux dans ma peau in the yes. French, you know, me sentir bien dans yes, la peau. Yeah. I, I feel better with myself. I feel uh, uh, better in my own skin. Yeah. Feel well in my skin, right? But also, I feel more connected to, to who I am and connected to the world around me. And it's from there that I then introduce the quantum, the, the, the simple aspects of quantum paradigm that explain to us that the reason that you experience wholeness and connectedness and coherence when you engage in these practices that make you feel well is because reality actually is whole and interconnected and coherent. And surprising, you may be surprised or maybe not, but a lot of CEOs are very happy to have sort of a science framing for understanding a fundamentally spiritual practice. Yes, yeah, so that's very interesting uh, what you are saying, Chris, because in fact, if I understand well, you are not starting by the science and the new science of this uh, uh, explaining the new paradigm. You are making them experience uh, this uh, wholeness, this connectedness, and this sense of coherence, and then only you frame them or you make them make sense of their experience by bringing in science, right? Yes. Yeah, and maybe this is what you are uh, elaborating in your book, uh, subsequently in your book, Quantum Leadership. And um, fundamentally, this connection is like the basis of your approach when you conduct workshops for, uh, let's say, based upon this interconnectedness practices. Yes. So, Chris, how, how important is this uh, practice, let's say, kind of part in your overall approach? Let's speak about that. It's, it's absolutely fundamental. Um, it's, it's the way that I give people an experience of this uh, type of uh, leadership, really. So the one thing I haven't mentioned so far is 
I not, o- I not only ask them, do they feel disconnected sometimes from the world? Do they feel, you know, negative emotions, um, disconnect, uh, fragmented? Uh, do they feel uh, somehow um, off balance? Uh, and then what, what practices do they have in their life? But I also then introduce a practice where we don't talk about the practice, we do it. So if I have a, a, a seminar room, let's say with 50 or 60 executives, we have this conversation, but early on in the conversation, I say, okay, let's do a practice. It can be to start with a simple breathing practice. And we go through that. Um, now, you know, simple breathing practices or, or mindfulness practices are being done all the time, every day in businesses around the world. But I think it's the, the particular context or framing that I'm giving this. I'm talking about engaging in practices to heal a person who is feeling very fragmented and off kilter, and then giving them a framework for making sense. You know, quantum paradigm is sense giving and sense making for that practice. And in some courses, like in university courses, you know, I teach a university course over 13 weeks where every week the students actually do a different practice. So I, I, don't, I tell them, don't tell the class about the practice, do it. So the practices can be, um, it can be art and aesthetics, it can be music, it can be nature immersion, it can be chair yoga because we're in a classroom. <laughs> um, it can be loving kindness meditation. It can be gratitude practice. Um, it can be um, uh, appreciative inquiry interviews. There are a variety of different practices. And what is helpful is to realize that not every practice is going to work for every so I used to think that nature immersion for sure will work for everybody. And that's why I sent you that, that uh, book chapter. Um, it's, it's certainly very important for me. But here's the thing. What I have found over six or seven years of teaching this is that, you know what? There are some people who don't like being in nature. And rather than judge them, I think that we have to say that's okay. That's just not that's Absolutely. Yeah, uh, um, I have the same experience as you, Chris. And um, some of my executive students, for example, they cannot sit more than one or two minutes, uh, close eyes and without doing anything. Yeah, and uh, then you engage them, uh, engage them in some, let's say, kind of meditative right. moments or tai chi yes. or whatever. And, uh, and it's fine. That's yeah, right. exactly what you say, right? Yeah. So, you know, they may not like that, but they may like walking meditation or um, they may, there are other, the the important thing is that across all the different kinds of practices and in the back of of the quantum leadership book, I have over a hundred practices, over 110 practices that are listed there and categorized. The important thing is that every person I believe every person out there is going to find at least one practice that works for them. And they need to discover that. It's not for me to tell them which one they should do. They need to experiment or find out in the course of their life. But the point is, is that we all need to pay more attention to our experience of the world around us, our experience of what it means to be a human being today. Because if we if we don't do that, then we yes, there is also a similar kind of uh, approach in Indian philosophy, and I will speak uh, particularly about the Advaita Vedanta, this non-duality wisdom tradition. I've been more, let's say, familiar with since uh, twenty-five years. So the the similarity in the approach is that there there is um, uh, a part which is a reflective or pure cognitive kind of or sense sense making you would say approach which is about looking at and examining our conclusion about the world its reality and my place in it and uh, coming to understand through dialogue conversation with objections and arguments 
uh, how my own conclusions, which are well entrenched, can be contradicted by this vision of oneness and uh, wholeness, right? And in addition to that, what is interesting is that there is also a lot of contemplative practices, right? And uh, practices, for example, of uh, which involve the body, like all this yoga practices, breathing, this pranayama, or also chanting. The large part is dedicated to chanting, and also performing exactly. rituals, which involve the entire body, mind, and speech. Exactly. And yes, what I uh, the modern version I would like here of uh, Vedanta, which is uh, can be seen in organization like uh, Art of Living or, or Ramakrishna Mission and so on, is that they give a lot of emphasis on social practices. So it means bringing alive this social connectedness, right? It's not just about thinking and feeling at peace through all these reflective or contemplative practices. It's also about how can I engage myself on this basis of my newly found, let's say, understanding of the world and my place in it, right? Well, you know, the, um, the physicist um, Oppenheimer, um, quantum physicist Oppenheimer, um, he famously said, um, the insights in modern physics are just a refinement of old wisdom. In 1954, uh, he said that. And, you know, I, I think um, what's happening is that great spiritual wisdom for thousands of years has known about this essential oneness that underlies the, rea the physical reality that we see that looks like it's all separate. Uh, and um, it's something that you see in, in all of the spiritual traditions. So you see it in Christianity, in, in Genesis, you, you see this notion of a timeless, spaceless void from which all things arise. In Taoism, you see it with the notion of the Tao, everything comes from the Tao and returns to the Tao. Um, and in Buddhism and in the Vedic tradition, you also have this notion of a background uh, consciousness or a, the, the uh, Brahman from which the, from which the, the, the uh, observable universe springs. And you see this in Zoroastrianism also. They have a concept of Asha. And you see it in the Jewish tradition also, the Kabbalah, which had the notion of Ein Sof, which is also an ineffable background consciousness. And then you've got David Bohm, the modern day physicist, writing in 1980, saying that consciousness is primary, along with you know, quantum reality, that uh, it's not one doesn't come from the other, that they are, they are both parts of uh, reality, that consciousness is also a fundamental uh, property of the universe. And so, again, you might think, well, why does a CEO care about these things? Well, if you sequence, if you sequence, if you sequence that, if you sequence all of this correctly, and if you, if, if early on you give people the, the practical experience of feeling connected to themselves, others, nature, and the world, um, then they become, in my, in my experience, they become quite willing to listen to this idea that we have one scientific paradigm in the last 350 years that talks about separateness and selfishness and another paradigm that, it, and it's really a Kunian war of, of ideas going on right now, but this new paradigm is, is converging on all of these great spiritual traditions to tell us that the nature of reality is in fact what these spiritual traditions, including um, the Vedic uh, philosophy, ha have told us for for you know very long time. And so, um, why is all this important? Because I think what happens is that if people have both an experience and a way to make sense of that experience, you give them the opportunity to change at the deep level of self-concept. You know, the, the notion of self-concept in psychology is 
you know, the, the, what is your salient self? And so when you are transformed in this way, you change your behavior, not because of what you know or what you choose to do. You change your behavior because of who you are. I think that's such an important thing. You know, we need to we need to educate we need to educate business leaders and we need to consult to business leaders in ways that help them um, progress or, or and and shift uh, a different way of being and not just give them technical knowledge or even emotional skills. That's not enough. We're never going to get out of the of these big problems of climate change and social inequity and you know plastic pollution and biodiversity loss. These are huge problems, and the only way we're going to be able to actually tackle them is if humanity itself tips into a different level of consciousness, a consciousness where we experience the world as so whole and so interconnected that we care for it because it's like caring for ourselves. We don't see nature as a resource or a playground. We see ourselves as integral to nature. I, I know you know all this. I'm saying this for the podcast, but Surya, I... Yes, absolutely, yes. Yes, but um, it's very important to bring this back at uh, this point of uh, our conversation. And in fact, it um, makes me think about another question, um, which is about the time required for this shift or this transformation. Um, how much time, because people do need time to undergo the shift, because it's a profound shift. I, I'm not speaking of the collective level, which is even a, a much longer time frame, at the level of the individual. So how do you account for this question when you design your interventions, for example, for CEOs and leaders and so on? Well, at, so this is a, in taking sort of a, um, a Buddhist uh, notion of uh, multiple uh, logics. So it's, it's one truth and its opposite are both true. Um, I would say that, you know, at one level, Surya, the, the transformation of the individual and access to this kind of wisdom can be instant. It's instantly accessible. Yes. And then we have also another school which says, uh, yeah, okay, what you say that theoretically instantaneous, yet it can happen, but it's only for rare cases. But they will emphasize the fact that you need for this to be happening in the mind the shift to have a mind which is already ready which is mature which is compassionate which is more or less lucid and objective and less distracted it it might be it it might be but you know there's there's the it, there's the initial aha the initial epiphany but then there are repeated times like for example let me ask you what do you have a practice that you do on a regular basis where you can get into a state almost instantly where you have an experience again of okay yes 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 absolutely yeah. yeah so it has to be renewed so i was saying it's yes and it's opposite so in in one level wisdom can be instantly accessible in another way it's something that we have to continue to do over and over and over but that's why practice is so good. You know, so in, in my life, I now have practices in my life that I do every day. And it's part of like maintaining the sense of connection to self, others, nature, and, and the transcendent. Yeah, so if I understand you well, Chris, what you're saying is that um, we can introduce or equip people who are attending these leadership interventions with a wide enough range of uh, practices and um, uh, this interconnectedness practices. And from then, once they have experienced this wide uh, range, they will um, uh, build and evolve their own portfolio of practices in time, right? And uh, be able to sustain their own journey, right? Is this what you're saying? Yeah. So, Chris, uh, as we are coming uh, close to the ending of this uh, podcast, 
Um, do you have any last word or maybe something you would like to emphasize that I, that I omitted to ask you and that you think is important for uh, the people who are listening to us now? Yes, thank you for, for uh, asking this, uh, this last question. Um, I think what we need to maybe finish this conversation with is uh, to remember that the big social and global challenges that we face, such as climate change and justice and equity um, and resource depletion, uh, biodiversity loss, uh, all of these questions, um, and also, you know, in some form, the, the backsliding of democracy, all of these big challenges are going to require uh, radically different solutions than what we've had in the past. Uh, it's no longer enough for business to do just less harm, you know, to reduce their carbon emissions, to minimize their social harm, to minimize the stress of employees. That's the past. That's corporate social responsibility in the last 20 years. In the future, if business is going to be relevant in addressing these big social and global problems, business needs to um, pursue system-wide positive impacts. System-wide positive impacts. And, and do it in a way that are profitable. You know? So I think there are plenty of examples out there of businesses that um, are fundamentally changing how an industry serves its customers in ways that are, are better for people and planet. And by the way, the Tata Group is famous for, for that. Uh, and um, there are many other examples um, in India that I, that I find very uh, admirable. So um, the, the need for this quantum leadership transformation that we have been speaking about is necessary for the well-being of future generations, given the magnitude of the challenges that we face today. That's where I would like to start. Great. Uh, thanks a lot, Chris, for this very, very stimulating conversation. I really enjoyed it, and I hope our listeners also uh, we, uh, are enjoying it as much as we did. <laughs> so let's keep in touch. Thanks. A lot. Yes. It's my pleasure. You were listening to Sapiens, special podcast series by SPJN Institute of Management and Research, Mumbai. Brought to you by SPJMR Center for Wisdom and Leadership, produced by Vinita Duvedi and the communications team.